Okay, so we'll resume our discussion on uh, Laplace transform and how it uh, be made useful for um, receptivity studies. Okay, <coughs> the central point is about using Laplace transform, uh, where we have uh, indicated how the transform relates with the original. Okay, the function in the physical plane we'll call it original. This is the transform. And uh, alpha is uh, complex, so it has two parts. So this part actually, uh, uh, if I take a contour along which this is a constant, I can take this out. So and then I can put it on the other side. Then this will be this, right? So that's what uh, we are talking about. That if we follow a contour, which we call as a Bromwich contour, uh, for which say alpha is constant, then this is the formula. Now, this is uh, nothing but your usual Fourier transform, except that um, this argument is complex. Unlike in Fourier transform, the argument is the real frequency, circular frequency. Here it is a complex uh, frequency. Okay. <coughs> so, um, we discussed uh, how we could uh, use this. Um, well, um, if uh, the transform has the following property that it has uh, only simple poles and uh, this quantity goes to 0, the transform goes to 0 for alpha going to infinity. Uh, then uh, we can use the Jordan's lemma uh, and as I, as I said the Bromwich contour is something like this constant alpha i. Now what I could do is I could uh, construct a closed contours where the simple poles are excluded. Huh? The way we have designed the contour in a very specific way that the pole at P 1 uh, is circumvented by indenting a contour around, which is joined with the main contour with this uh, vertical line B 1, B 2 and B 3, B 4. Right? So, <coughs> uh, what uh, we are saying then that if uh, we uh, go uh, to alpha equal to infinity. What does this mean alpha equal to infinity? Alpha equal to infinity, it is a complex quantity right alpha. So, it is uh, modulus going to infinity means what? It is like a radial vector with the radius going to infinity. So, alpha going to infinity is actually the point at infinity and that is nothing but a circle. right? So, what you are noticing here is half the circle. And this semicircle is on the upper side, that is why I have given it some kind of a name as C u prime. Okay. What, what is this? C 1 is the contour and you see how we have progressed <coughs> in performing this contour integral. We have gone from minus infinity to plus infinity, then we followed along, then we came down, went around this way and then went up and the closed the contour. So, there are certain things that you notice the main contour is counterclockwise, but the C 1 is clockwise, right. We must remember that. So, <coughs> contour integral depends on uh, the direction in which you do go. So, C u prime what we are calling here is nothing but the whole contour minus C 1. That is uh, one thing that we understand here. The other thing is also you notice that this is kind of a, a mathematical indenting. So, the contribution from B 1 and B 2 will cancel from B 3, B 4 because B 1, B 2 you are going down, B 3, B 4 you are going up. So, they will cancel each other. So, basically then the whole contour would uh, consist of the contribution coming from C u prime and C 1. Huh? Okay, so, this is how we uh, do it and we are saying one more thing is that contribution coming from this semicircle would go to 0. That is what is called the Jordan's lemma and the Jordan's lemma is valid only when the transform go to 0. Um, if a function, complex function um, has this property then uh, Jordan's lemma can be used and Cauchy's theorem states what? For an analytic function, if I take a closed contour, f z d z is 0. 
So, that is what we have done by uh, sort of designing the contour in such a way that this region everywhere the function is regular right analytic only pole is here and that has been excluded from the region. So, f z d z over this whole contour should be equal to 0 that is your Cauchy's theorem. Okay. So, then what happens is uh, we do this that is what uh, we have done in this and what we find that uh, this is uh, what you get that uh, C upper as I told you consists of C 1 and the rest of it. right? So, C u prime also includes the Bromwich contour. Okay. Now, uh, in this C upper f z d z is 0. Okay. So, this is uh, what we are talking about. So, here of course, uh, z is replaced by alpha. So, this is what we get and please understand f z is nothing but f 2 alpha times e to the power i alpha x. This is the whole thing. right? The whole thing is uh, your f z there. <coughs> now, uh, this part I did not do cleanly. So, I thought I will do it uh, today. So, what I did now? I have uh, this integral evaluated over C u prime plus the integral evaluated over C 1 equal to 0. So, I put this one on this side and now when I did the when I do this I notice that C 1 is in uh, clockwise direction. So, what I do is I can make it plus and make this counter clockwise and you know that is the definition of positive quantity. So, we have this. So, basically then <coughs> the contribution coming from B r plus this is nothing but equal to the contribution coming from this. And uh, you know that uh, that this quantity uh, what I have done here I have changed it to minus C 1. Uh, what is this? This will be 2 pi i times the residue of this calculated at alpha at the pole. And this is the definition how you calculate the residue. So, I could have different order uh, pole. So, if I have say mth order pole, what I do? I take the function, I differentiate it m minus 1 times, and of course, divide by 1 minus uh, 1 by m minus 1 factorial, and then substitute alpha equal to alpha p 1. That is the way to calculate the residue. So, once I do that, I am done. And this case that we have just now talked about, uh, we have a simple single pole, but you can now see you can extend the logic. If you had uh, if you have let us say more number of uh, poles, suppose I have another pole here, what I could do is I could just simply do what I have done there, right. I could just simply go there and circumvent this way and then I will go this way. Okay. So, I could uh, call this as say B 5 and B 6 and this I could call it as C 2 and let us say B 7 and B 8 and once again you can see that B 5, B 6 and B 7, B 8 will cancel out and this uh, will be now this. So, then what will happen then rest of the contour would be uh, given by the residue calculated at P 1 and P 2. So, you can just simply add it up. Mm. Now, if the contribution coming from this semicircular arc is 0, then of course, whatever we have calculated is nothing but the integration over the Bromwich contour. Right? Well, we will come to that. This, this is an intriguing development uh, uh, that is going to take place. We want to see what happens. So, at this point in time, what we are saying that if I do this, I will get this. Now, uh, what happens is <coughs> any pole lying above corresponds to the downstream propagating pole. Right? Uh, that is uh, one thing we are talking about and instead of closing it on the upper side, I could have also closed it on the lower side. That is what we are calling as C D. Okay? And then, 
whatever I have done here, I could have done it there also. But there, those poles would correspond to contribution coming from the upstream propagation. <laughs> okay. So, this is something that we uh, need to remember, but you do not really need to worry about uh, doing either closing the contour on top or closing the contour on the bottom, because this circular arc, if Jordan's lemma is valid, does not contribute anything. However, as I told you, this uh, semicircular arc uh, with a radius going to infinity is nothing but half the point at infinity. So, what do we call? If, if, if the function is not 0 there, we call it the function to have a essential singularity. right? You have heard of that essential singularity. For example, e to the power z, cos z, sin z, z going to infinity. Do they disappear? They do not disappear to 0 when z goes to infinity. right? Uh, so, uh, if I have such functions, then of course, uh, Jordan's lemma is not uh, going to be valid. So, in uh, developing this uh, theory, this part of the theory, we are assuming that there are no essential singularities. That is what Jordan's lemma means, right? Okay. Then this is what we uh, started in the last class, talking about uh, familiarizing uh, ourselves quickly about Fourier integral and transforms, and uh, that's what we said. If I have a function f of t, um, is a direct transform is f of omega is given like this, and uh, this transform itself will have a real and imaginary part, which I could write it as r omega plus i of i times i of omega, or I could write it in terms of the amplitude and a phase part. So this both are uh, uh, viable options, right? So this this is what we uh, do. <coughs> now uh, we did. Uh, spend a little time uh, talking about uh, this. This A of omega is the amplitude or the spectrum, hmm? whereas A square would be correspondingly the energy. right? That is what is called as the energy spectrum and phi is the phase angle. We talked about it that this representation is valid at all continuous points. At discontinuities, we take the uh, right hand limit and left hand limits average. That is what we did. And we say that this function is absolutely integrable if I take the modulus of f of t and integrate it for all possible range of time. If it is bounded, then we know it is absolutely integrable. And uh, this is where we realize that uh, not all functions are absolutely integrable, and that is where we need to really uh, make uh, omega as complex. We realize that is what we did here also, right? That is what we did it here also. And then uh, what happens is f of t also I can write it like this. What does it mean to have a real and imaginary part? Well, think of f of t as some kind of a response of the system. And we have already uh, yesterday we talked about time origin when I start the experiment. So, existence of f 1 and f 2 implies that I have a modulus times a phase shift. So, I can give an input of one kind of time dependence, but the output could lag behind and phase shifted. That is that phase shift relationship is given, given by the relationship between f 1 and f 2. Okay. <coughs> now, uh, if we uh, define then f of t, the response in terms of a real and imaginary part, the real and imaginary part of the transform is given in terms of this. Right. So, this is what we uh, would uh, be uh, using often. So, let us uh, familiarize ourselves. And we can do a similarly uh, an inverse transform to get back this f 1 and f 2 in terms of r and i. Okay? This is what it is. For some reason, let us say if f, t, uh, f of t is real, uh, then what we find from here uh, that r of omega is given by this. And uh, it is going to be an even function if f1 itself is even, right? Then instead of uh, doing the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, we can do a half range integration and multiply by 2 if f1 also happens to be 
are an even function. Same way, uh, if f1 is uh, even, then i omega becomes an odd function. Okay. <coughs> Suppose, um, say f of t is real uh, and even, then uh, I have said that uh, this part is even, this, this is an even function multiplied by even function is even and while this one becomes odd. So, what happens? R of omega can be done like this, i of omega will be 0. All right? uh, in contrast, if f of t is real and odd, then I have the complementary picture r of omega will be 0, i of omega will be given in terms of this. Okay? <coughs> and uh, we talked about causality, a causal function is 1 that is uh, equal to 0. And from a receptivity point of view, this makes tremendous sense. If I have not started the experiment, the past cannot uh, dictate what is going to happen in future. Okay. <coughs> now, uh, we can uh, also see uh, one interesting aspect is, if I replace um, omega by minus omega, then uh, you can see earlier I had e to the power minus i omega t. So, it becomes e to the power plus i omega t and that would be simply nothing but f of minus t e to the power minus i omega t dt. So, Fourier transform of f of minus t would be given by the complex conjugate of f of omega. Right? <coughs> uh, if we can split the f of t in terms of uh, a even component and odd component, how do you construct a even component? Well, very easy. You take uh, the average of plus t and minus t contribution that will give you the even part and if I subtract it, I get the odd part. Hmm? So, this is uh, one way of uh, uh, representing the same f, f of t in terms of even and odd component. You can uh, clearly see that um, Fourier transform of this will be r of omega. right? Whereas, uh, if I uh, take the Fourier transform of this, I will get uh, i times i of omega. You can just simply substitute in the formula and you will get that. Uh, this today's class, we are uh, mostly going to uh, talk about uh, some of this uh, mathematical fundamentals, but we will also try to connect it with what we intend doing. <coughs> Now, uh, we have seen for a causal function, f of t will be nothing but twice of uh, f even or twice of f odd. So, if I have a real causal function, then I can determine it either in terms of r or in terms of i, either of the formula. When you do this, this is what is called as a cosine transform, this is what is called as a sine transform. So, Fourier transform is the most generic form, but if you have a real causal function, you can get away with uh, performing cosine or sine transform. And you would note that um, in many of this uh, utilities and packages, you do have an option of computing sine and cosine uh, transforms. Okay. <coughs> well, uh, we did uh, talk about this, uh, that if I have a function in the physical plane given by f of t and the Fourier transform in the spectral plane as f of omega, the correspondence between the two is given by this double sided arrow. So, this is what it means that they are related by the formula we have talked about. We talked about then uh, two such functions f 1 and f 2, which have their respective uh, transform pairs and we showed the linearity property holds. Because Fourier transform operation itself is a linear operation. It does not matter whether f of t is governed by nonlinearity or not. The transform is a linearity operation, right? Mm. And this Fourier transform property directly transforms to Laplace transform. Okay, so there is no such problem. And we have uh, noted the symmetry property also that if uh, f of t uh, relates to capital F of omega, then I can actually construct a time-dependent function uh, whose form is given by this transform. So capital F of t is nothing but 2 pi of f minus. I am not doing it. You can just simply substitute in the formula and you will just uh, get them right away. 
Or you can look at that book by Papoulis. It's a fantastic book, one of the best book that one can come across on this subject. Okay, uh, we did talk about uh, time scaling. This also directly comes from the definition of the Fourier transform. Hmm? And what this is, uh, it is uh, that if I stretch the time, let us say alpha is more than 1, then I am taking each time and multiplying it. So, I am stretching the time, then the corresponding transform will appear like this. Once again, I will uh, uh, invite you to prove it yourself. Okay? And you will find that uh, this is a kind of a duality property. So, if I stretch it in the physical plane, it contracts in the transform plane. And if alpha is less than 1, then I am contracting in the physical plane, it extends in the transform plane. Okay? So, this is the property that we uh, readily also can see as an example, if I have a sim simple periodic behavior of a function. So, that means what? In the physical plane, I have a signal which goes from uh, all possible time ranges. And what happens in the transform plane? You just simply have a delta function. So, that is essentially is a fallout of this time scaling theory. So, you can uh, benefit from it. And this property also will directly apply to Laplace transform for alpha positive. Okay. <coughs> okay. Mm. Incidentally, you are looking at it that we are talking about alpha here is not that wave number, it is a, a real constant alpha. Okay. Mm. Now, there is uh, additional properties that also you can very clearly show that uh, if your time origin is shifted from 0 to t naught, then you will see that corresponding transform is just simply multiplied by e to the power minus i omega t naught. It is that simple and we will use uh, some of these properties. Uh, in the context of Laplace transform also, uh, it remains valid there. Time shifting is uh, one such property, shifting of origin. The same way, if I shift my uh, frequency also from uh, omega equal to 0 to omega naught, the corresponding time dependent function is obtained by just simply multiplying f of t with e to the power i omega naught t. Okay. <coughs> this also directly applies to Laplace transform. Now, this is something that uh, we need to uh, know the property of uh, this. If I have a function f and I, if I uh, differentiate it and then take its Fourier transform, then this is what we are going to get. Say, n th derivative of the function is related to f of omega um, by just simply multiplying by i omega to the power n. Okay? So, this is uh, something that we can do. Now, if you uh, are uh, imaginative enough, you can uh, realize that if I replace t by x, then uh, what will happen? Uh, I am talking about some kind of a spatial gradient, right? And uh, we will make use of this property very often, as you would see that when we uh, talk about uh, distributions like uh, source sink doublet etcetera, there we will uh, explore this possibility. So, uh, in time uh, frame we can do this, but uh, for Laplace transform what happens? We need to worry about all kinds of initial conditions, they are all given here in terms of uh, this is what we had. Now, you have to add uh, the first the function itself at t equal to 0, then we will have uh, the deri first derivative, the second derivative, all the way up to n minus 1 as derivative evaluated at the origin. Okay. <coughs> uh, there is this um, other uh, nice property of uh, frequency differentiation. So, we uh, take f of omega, differentiate it in times with respect to omega. We can show that the corresponding original is simply nothing but f of t times minus i t to the power n. Well, these are all uh, uh, nice properties. We can actually create a sort of a basket of uh, Fourier transforms and its originals, and that is what you can see in many standard book on Fourier transform. There is one more thing that we often uh, talk about. Um, this um, is quite often used: is the moment, moment of a function. So, you, if I have f of t. And let us say I am talking about the nth moment, that means I am multiplying the function uh, 
by g to the power n and then I am performing that same integral. But please do understand there is no e to the power i business. Huh? This is just a simple uh, moment here. Then uh, what happens is I have the Fourier transform m f of t is f of omega. Now, if I take the Fourier transform m of m a subscript n, this is what I get. So, this, this is quite often used actually for interpreting experimental data, uh, especially in the context of turbulent flows people try to figure out uh, how various moments are. Uh, what, what is the significance of moments in the context of uh, a random signal? They will give you the various uh, statistics, right? right? The average is the first moment, then the RMS is the second moment and so on and so forth. You have skewness, kurtosis and so on and so forth they all come from there. So, if I know the function or if I have some knowledge of the function and its Fourier transform, I can actually measure those moments in the lab and can see how the actual function is going to be. Okay. <coughs> well, uh, in the context of uh, this moment theorem, we can talk about a quantity called convolution. Okay. What is convolution? Say, I have two functions f 1 x and f 2 x. Then I can construct a function f of x which is defined like this. So, I take f 1 of a dummy variable y and f 2 whose variable is now x minus y and integrate over all possible y's from minus infinity to plus infinity. Then the right hand side is essentially going to be a function of x alone and that is what we are calling. Uh, this has a property uh, this uh, f of x uh, has uh, a property with the transforms of f 1 and f 2 and uh, we will see that it is given here in this uh, slide. But first of all, uh, we note that there is a symbolic notation for the convolution. f of x would be written by f 1 of x star f 2 of x. This is just notational uh, convenience. Okay. <coughs> Uh, then what happens is, um, we can talk about a convolution theorem. The convolution theorem states the following that if I have two functions f 1 of t and f 2 of t corresponding transforms are f 1 of omega and f 2. Then the convolution of f 1 and f 2 is simply nothing but the product of the transforms. So, that is why uh, convolution plays uh, such an important role that uh, the convolution in the physical space is equal to the product of the transform in the spectral space. This is what is called as uh, time convolution theorem. right? <coughs> Similarly, you will also have a, a frequency convolution theorem. Frequency convolution theorem basically tells you that you define a convolution in the frequency plane and that has a original which is just simply nothing but product of f 1 and f 2. So, this, these two are uh, quite uh, useful theorems, which we will uh, use them as we go along and let us now talk about some things which are going to be of use in our study. Okay. The first and foremost is of course, uh, um, the Dirac delta function. We do not want to go through this uh, the usual way of talking about the continuous function etcetera. Uh, it is better that we uh, adopt uh, the distributions and the first element of distribution is of course, the delta function. Uh, you know its property, its property is that uh, if you perform this integral, uh, the integrand may take a uh, unlimited value, but the integral will be limited. Okay. So, if I put it like this, so what does it mean? delta of t is 0, when t is non-zero, when t equal to 0, it just equal to 1. So, if I put that here and I perform the integral, it becomes 1. Okay. <coughs> so, this is what uh, we have talked about uh, in the past when we are discussing about uh, frequency response versus impulse response. This property as you can see that if I create a delta function in the physical plane. So, I am just giving a excitation at t equal to 0, 
that fills up my frequency plane completely and they are all weighted equally there is no bias. So, if you are trying to look at uh, let us say the natural frequency of the thing you excite the whole system with all the frequencies and the system will pick up its natural frequency. So, that is why we said uh, in the last class also that why impulse response would be preferable over frequency response. Now, what you can do? This was for uh, when the impulse was given at t equal to 0, but suppose I give the impulse at t equal to t naught, then I can do the time shift property. Huh? Time shift property, what does it do? The corresponding uh, transform instead of 1, it will become e to the power minus i omega t naught. This is what just now we have written down. So, you can uh, see that uh, uh, we can talk about a dynamical system where you could have let us say the delta functions not applied once, but in a sequence and then we can add all of them up and we know they are tra transforms as given by this uh, theory. Okay. <coughs> now, uh, um, we also can use the symmetry property. You recall that we had talked about if I have f of omega from there I can capital F of omega. I can construct a capital I f of t. So, we can do that because we have seen the if I use a delta function my transform is 1. So, now let us talk about if I have a constant function in the physical plane it is 1 everywhere the corresponding Fourier transform is given by this right. This is the symmetry property. So, this is direct application of the symmetry property. Now, what else we can do? There are lots of things we can do interestingly enough with all those properties. Frequency shift theorem applied here. So, if I uh, shift the circular frequency from omega to omega naught and then I will get just simply e to the power i omega naught t. Okay. Ah, but we also know what cosine omega naught t is not nothing but half of e to the power i omega t plus e to the power minus i omega naught t. So, then what happens? I can see the correspondence. Now, this function would have this. This comes from here, right? Delta omega minus omega naught will give me this multiplied by 2 pi. This 2 is, of course, is there, and this part will give me delta of omega. So, basically, then uh, exciting a system by a real frequency, real function cosine omega naught t is equivalent to in the frequency plane giving two delta functions symmetrically located about the origin uh, at plus minus <coughs> omega naught about the origin right that is what it means. So, that is your uh, way of uh, interpreting the application of a cosine function. Well, you can do the same thing with a sine function only thing is uh, note that there is a iota here in the uh, basement that will give you this. Uh, relationship between the original and the transform. This also is uh, nothing but uh, two delta functions, but instead of average there we have a minus here. right? So, that is that is what it comes. The next thing that we would like to do is what is called as a sine function. Sine function is uh, interesting. Uh, it is like this. Suppose, uh, I have uh, the time axis like this. Uh, the sine function is like this that for negative t it is minus 1 and for positive t it is plus 1. So, this is minus 1, this is plus 1. So, that is what is called as a sine function or signum function and it is uh, indicated by this S g n signum of t and uh, its transform is 2 by i omega. Well, um, it, 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 it does not fall out uh, readily. So, let us uh, see how we can do it. So, basically let us do the other way around. Let us say I have this f of omega given by 2 by i omega. So, I can construct the original from the property. So, I just substitute instead of f of omega 2 by i omega. So, I get uh, 1 over pi and this. And this is a very, very interesting function. Huh? This is a very, very interesting function. This is like your 
sin alpha x by x d x integrated over all range. And what happens is that alpha, if alpha is uh, positive, then this integral becomes plus 1. If alpha is negative, the integral becomes minus 1. Okay. So, that is what we are saying. So, in this context, what will happen? Here, integral is over omega. So, if t is positive, this will be plus 1 and if t is negative, this will be minus 1 and that is what we have shown here. So, basically we have shown that if f of omega is this, then the corresponding time domain function is like this. right? So, that is uh, what we uh, do consider as uh, useful, because we can use it to define the Heaviside function. So, this is your uh, signum function. And what is your Heaviside function? That also you know that uh, Heaviside function is this, that it is 0 for all the negative uh, argument, then it uh, becomes 1. And this function is, uh, we are calling it as u of t. Okay. <coughs> now, you can uh, see that uh, these two are somewhat uh, related. Hmm? These two are somehow related. What I could do is, I could shift it up. Hmm? If I shift it up, then this becomes plus 2. Then, if I divide by 2, then I will get this. So, that is what we are done here. So, I have shifted first by 1, then added the signum function, the whole thing has been divided by 2. So, that heaviside function is like this. Clear? And once I have this, I can get it Fourier transform or Laplace transform. That is easy, because this is the constant. You recall that we just now talked about the symmetry property. So, if uh, I have a constant quantity, that is nothing but a delta function in the transform plane. And signum function, we have just now seen, it is 2 by i omega, but due to this uh, factor half, we have this. So, this is where we are. Okay. Now, that uh, we know what this uh, is, uh, what did we get? U of t uh, has this uh, transform pi of uh, delta omega plus uh, 1 over i omega, right? That is what we saw. So, now what we could do is, we can use a frequency shift theorem. Then what will happen? If I take u of t and multiply it by e to the power i omega naught t, then I will shift the origin from omega to omega naught, omega equal to 0 to omega naught. So, then this argument will become this and this will be this. So, you can very clearly see what is the utility of this? This is very, very important. Now, go back and think about your Schubert's Cranstad experiment. What, what did they do? They took a ribbon, vibrated harmonically. So, that frequency omega naught was given and they did start the experiment at some finite time. It is not like something which had gone on from minus infinity to and it is going on forever. Although for mathematical expediency, sometimes people do that, but we realize that in a real experiment, we need to invoke the Heaviside function, because we need to create a signpost for time, that it has started at this time and that is our t equal to 0. Then we are basically doing this and this is what it is. Okay? Why we are doing this? Because in the physical experiment, we have started at a finite time and when we apply the <coughs> let us say the governing equations, that we will be doing in terms of Orson field equation, which was written in alpha or omega plane. If we do that, then we need to derive those conditions, the boundary conditions that we are talking about in the spectral plane and that is what we have established here. Okay? <coughs> so, uh, if, you, if you are squeamish about uh, that and you say, look, I would rather do it with the cosine function, then the input is like this u of t started at t equal to 0 and cosine omega naught t. Then of course, what will happen here? I will have to add up, uh, remember, the e to the power i omega t plus e to the power minus i omega naught t. 
divided by 2. So, that will give me this part and the same thing will do it there and then we get this simplification. So, this is uh, what we can do. <coughs> so, I think we have uh, done uh, quite a bit of uh, things, but I will just simply um, uh, state one observation without uh, doing much about it. Maybe some of you could do it later is um, you know in your uh, textbook on fluid mechanics you have been uh, told about what is the stream function or the velocity potential due to a source or a sink. What are the sources and sinks? They are nothing but your delta function right. So, if I look at uh, the actual problem can I solve it? Can I solve the problem? Because the governing equation is what? Laplace's equation for phi or psi. Now, if I give a boundary condition that I am putting a source or sink at say the origin, then I can calculate the field. So, that is what uh, I make this observation that the potential flow results for source sink doublet can be obtained using the same procedure uh, by uh, using Laplace's equation as the governing differential equation. Um, we have also uh, not uh, going to talk about it, but you can take a look at Papoulis's book that if I take this uh, delta function time shifted and differentiate it n times and multiply it by some phi of t and integrate over all possible range of time, we get this. Okay. So, what I could do is uh, I could uh, obtain the Fourier transform of uh, the nth derivative of delta function and that if I call it as f of omega then use this relation here. Now, you can see uh, here phi of t is this e to the power i omega t right. So, that will be minus 1 d uh, n d t n of phi of t at so, t is 0, right. So, what do I get? I get this. What is the implication of this? Well, implication of this is if I have a source or sink, I use delta function, but if I have a doublet, I have the first derivative of the delta function, right. So, it is basically having a source and sink brought close together. So, that is like your derivative of a delta function. So, if I look at the first one, and I will get the result for doublet. And uh, people working on acoustics problem, uh, they do use all kinds of uh, combinations of this singularities. They use quadrupoles, octopoles, etcetera. So, they are nothing but those higher derivatives of delta function. So, you can actually use some of these. Okay. There is uh, one very interesting function, which we uh, often like to use and that is the Gaussian function. Gaussian function or sometimes uh, uh, they are also called the Hermitian function. Uh, what is the property of this that is displayed here? Property of the Gaussian function is I can try to obtain it Fourier transform. Huh? So, what I would do? I will take the function multiply by e to the power i omega minus i omega t and integrate. Then what happens here? If I uh, add this to uh, exponent together, then I will have minus half t square plus 2 i omega t. Okay. <coughs> there is a minus sign sitting outside, right? minus half. So, what I could do is I could write it as a kind of a uh, exact square. So, that will be t plus i omega whole square. So, I have basically then added this part up. So, I take it out. That is a constant. right? So, I can take it out of the integral because it is a t integral. So, I get this. Now, what I could do is I could uh, do a little bit of manipulation uh, write this as t plus i omega uh, by root 2 as the independent variable. Then since I have put in a root 2 here I multiply it there. So, then what happens? This is this is also we are uh, quite familiar. Huh? This, this is what we are quite familiar. Uh, we can show 
once again by complex uh, analysis we can uh, show that you know if I call this as i, I can uh, multiply it by another i and there instead of calling it x square by 2, I can call it as y square by 2 and then uh, i square will be nothing but e to the power r square by 2 and d x d y you can map the area into r d r d theta you know 2 pi r into d theta and you get that and you can show that this is the result. Okay. So, what happens <coughs> that if I take the original as e to the power minus t square by 2 the Gaussian function look at its Fourier transform that is also e to the power minus omega square by 2. So, this is uh, the property of self reciprocity uh, the function reproduces itself upon taking the transform. Okay. So, whenever uh, such a thing happens uh, they are called the Hermitian functions or Hermite functions uh, they have this generic equation you can uh, uh, take the derivative of e to the power minus t square and then you can get a whole set of Hermite functions uh, of different order n and the corresponding Fourier transform we will call it as uh, h of n and one can show well this is a mistake here uh, that root 2 pi h n of t should be i to the power n h n of uh, omega and you can show that. Okay. So, I think we have uh, now uh, done with uh, this part. Now, what we could do is we could go back to what we have been uh, looking at. We are talking about the receptivity. We have seen through all of this. So, let us uh, go over. Uh, we have, oh, there we are. See, we are now talking about Schubert's Kramstad kind of experiment. Huh? So, there we uh, give this kind of uh, input. Hmm? Now, we want to solve it as an excitation problem, not as an eigenvalue problem. So, what is happening here is now we are going to solve the problem the way we have uh, seen we will uh, talk about small disturbance. So, we will be talking about uh, linearized Navier-Stokes equation. So, linearized Navier-Stokes equation is uh, rather easy we have seen it. Uh, if we do a Fourier transform of that equation what do we get? We have seen that that is nothing but our or some field equation. Okay. And what happened? Or some field equation involves let us say I have this uh, flat plate, uh, I want to study this now what I need to study? I need to study let us say at a given x location what I would be doing? I would be solving our some field equation from some limit of y equal to 0 to let us say y going to infinity large value. And what is it that Schubert's Kramstad experiment did? They vi vibrated a ribbon very close to the wall. So, we will uh, just simplify it furthermore. We will say we will vibrate the ribbon at the wall itself. That is the corresponding receptivity experiment. So, I have a vibrating ribbon right at the wall itself and that uh, quantity is given like this. Right? Now, what happens? I get this. Now, you can also see why we uh, did talk about uh, signal problem in the last class. In the last class, we said that if I vibrate a ribbon with uh, omega equal to uh, omega naught, response is also at omega naught. But now, what you are seeing here? The input itself, of course, it has a contribution at omega naught, but it has also a contribution elsewhere. See, this could be a delta function, no problem. This is corresponding to what you may think of in terms of the signal problem assumption, because you are doing it 
exciting the system at omega naught, you are seeing the response through this path. But what about this path? This path is not gone. So, this part actually decays around there, but still it is there. So, even though I am exciting the system at a fixed frequency omega naught, I am also exciting its neighborhood altogether. So, what happens is sing signal problem assumption is not all that a great uh, thing and this is what uh, we realized and we tried to work on it. So, what we uh, would be then talking about instead of uh, this signal problem, we may actually like to do here keep it omega and then we perform a second integral in the omega plane also. However, for the sake of understanding what happens in the receptivity problem, let us assume that we are uh, talking about a signal problem and then what we are doing, this is the type of our boundary condition. Hmm. So, what I have done? at the wall, I am saying that there is no slip e equal to 0, but I am let us say blowing and sucking mass at a frequency omega naught and I am doing it at a fixed location. Let us fix my origin there itself, that is why I am calling it a <coughs> delta x. You delta x minus x naught, there is no problem. We have seen the time shift theorem can be used. Now, what we have to do is we will have to satisfy the boundary condition. How do you satisfy the boundary condition? If you recall, if you recall that uh, we have uh, four modes for our sort of equation, it is a fourth order OD. So, I could talk about A1 phi 1 plus A2 phi 2 plus A3 phi 3 plus A4 phi 4. What do we know about uh, this individual modes phi 1 to phi 4? Well, we only know when we go outside the shear layer. Recall that is how in uh, defining the initial condition for compound matrix method, we evaluated those modes. You can substitute uh, your condition of y going to y infinity, what will happen? u of y will become 1, u double prime will become 0 and then we will have a constant coefficient O d fourth order and we get those four modes and we saw that this one. Uh, so, as uh, y goes to infinity, we noted phi 1 which I will now give additional subscript infinity goes as e to the power minus alpha y and phi 2 infinity goes as e to the power plus alpha y, phi 3 infinity goes as e to the power minus q y. You remember the definition of that q square, so you can take a look at that and this will be this. Now, if you are talking about a wall excitation and if you say that real part of alpha is positive, then this is not admissible this is not admissible because this are showing it to grow with y. So, we have to keep only in terms of this. So, how can this uh, happen? Well, this kind of things can happen only if we switch off a 2 and a 4 term. So, we have uh, two terms a 1 phi 1 plus a 3 phi 3. So, what I will do is I uh, will just stop here and I will ask you to look at these conditions. Now, what happens is we will satisfy the conditions at the wall. At the free stream, we have already done it by excluding phi 2 and phi 4 contribution, we have already satisfied these two conditions. But now we can fix a 1 and a 3 by satisfying these two conditions, and you will be able to get this equation. That is what I want you to take a look, but we will uh, redo it. Again.